The average height of a person is 165 centimeters, or 5 feet 5 inches. The largest and heaviest mammals ever to have lived on land were the Endricotheriums. They were almost 5 meters, 16.4 feet high, and weighed 17 to 20 tons. The giant deep-sea squid species of the family can grow to enormous sizes, with the latest estimate of up to 13 meters, or 43 feet. Historically, our planet has seen many such giants. But why does nature make animals of different sizes at all? Why are some animals big and others small? How is this defined? Are there size limits? Why were dinosaurs so huge? But now there are no such living organisms. Is it good to be huge? And is it possible for a real Godzilla or King Kong to exist? Let's dive in to find out this and so much more. Giant Animals The first dinosaurs were by no means giants. Large species were three to four meters long, and small ones literally were under their feet, reaching even less than 50 centimeters and weighing up to two kilograms. But then something changed, and the dinosaurs grew rapidly, generation after generation. Bipedal species reached 13 to 14 meters, and quadrupeds could grow up to 25 to 35 meters long. Record holders like Diplodocus holorum reached 39 meters. It was even called Seismosaurus, which is symbolic because seismos means earthquake in Greek. The steps taken by these giants would certainly easily be registered by seismic instruments like light tremors. At first glance, you might not be impressed by dozens of meters, well, it's not a mile, but everything comes into perspective when visually compared to a person. In the entire history of our planet, these reptiles still occupy the first place among the largest land animals. It's hard to compare our modern elephants with them, and even any ancient mammals too. For example, the largest and heaviest mammals ever to have lived on land are the Indrocotheria. They were almost five meters high and weighed 17 to 20 tons. They lived about 20 to 30 million years ago in many parts of Asia and mainly fed on leaves and branches. Now, how is it that such two evolutionarily successful animal groups are so different in terms of size? A part of the answer lies in the way they produce their offspring. Like you and me, Indricotherium was a placental mammal. This means that an individual bears its cub in its own womb until the moment when it becomes more or less viable. Large mammals, such as giraffes, rhinos, or elephants raise one young at a time, and the gestation period is quite long. For example, elephants carry their young for over two years. Some species of animals don't even live that long. But the largest dinosaurs didn't need to bear their cubs at all because they just lay eggs. The largest dinosaur laid eggs no larger than a soccer ball. But how does this difference in offspring production affect size? Large mammals give birth to large babies. It takes a lot of time and energy. Simply put, growing becomes too taxing for the body as the lion's share of resources goes to growing the fetus. Plus, pregnancy itself makes the individual more vulnerable. Dinosaurs completely avoided this problem. Instead of having large babies, huge dinosaurs laid relatively small eggs that contained equally small babies. The vulnerability of small growing dinosaurs to predators was compensated by the number. We still see this in principle in sea turtles. They build clutches of up to 100 eggs each but only a few survive from the entire clutch. The way of reproduction wasn't the only evolutionary advantage that contributed to their gigantic size. Another important point lies in the skeleton structure. 
Dinosaur skeletons had a feature that mammals don't have, a complex system of air sacs. These were special pockets made of animal tissues connected to the lungs. Usually, these sacs were attached to the bones in the neck, back, and hips. In some large dinosaurs, these pouches were even found inside the bones. They allowed the huge skeleton to hold its shape, while the bones themselves remained fairly light. These sacs also allowed the dinosaurs to grow in size without a proportional increase in strength and mass. But how do we know that extinct dinosaurs had such sacs? Partly because modern, non-extinct dinosaurs have them too. Wait a minute, what modern dinosaurs? Curious viewers have probably already guessed. Here they are. We are used to treating birds as something graceful, sublime, and heavenly. We don't see how they resemble reptiles that are so down to earth in every sense of the word, but there is a strong resemblance hiding in plain sight. Now, birds are direct descendants of dinosaurs, and they also have a similar system. For a flying bird, every gram of its mass is significant, and air sacs are just great for lightening the weight. When scientists compared the skeletons of birds and dinosaurs, they found identical places for attaching such bags. Studies of large dinosaur skeletons have also shown that there are such sacs inside some bones. But hollow bones aren't everything. In one study, scientists from the University of Massachusetts Amherst found that even the bone tissue itself in many dinosaurs had a structure that was designed to reduce weight. By examining the structure of the trabecular bone in dinosaurs, scientists found that its very design made it possible to have a lower bone density without sacrificing strength. But a good skeleton is still what allowed dinosaurs to grow to such sizes, but didn't facilitate growth. The question remains, what actually facilitated growth? The abundance of food sources have obviously played its part, but that wasn't the only factor. Indeed, during the heyday of the dinosaurs, the planet was an incredible oasis teeming with life. But behind the thriving nature was an important factor, oxygen. There was more oxygen in those days than now. Metaphorically speaking, dinosaurs became so huge because the air they breathed was rich in oxygen. Such an unexpected conclusion was made by the American professor Morgan Schaller from the Renaissance Institute in Troy. It would seem the subject of his studies is totally unrelated to giant reptiles. Specifically, he researched the levels of oxygen in the rocks of North America. We tested rocks from the Colorado Plateau and the Newark Basin that formed at the same time about 1,000 kilometers apart on the Pangaea supercontinent, the scientist says. Our results show that about 215 million years ago, over a period of just 3 million years, which is a very short term, geologically speaking, the level of oxygen in the atmosphere jumped from 15 to 19 percent. Why this happened is still unclear, but the scientist noted that around the same time, dinosaurs began to grow dramatically in size. Professor of the University of Bristol, Michael Benton, commenting on this study, also pointed out the obvious dependence of a sharp jump in the dinosaur size on increased oxygen content. And if the oxygen hypothesis of dinosaur gigantism still causes a lot of debate, then this is beyond any doubt when it comes to the ancient giant insects. Modern insects cannot boast of large sizes, and the word insect itself is synonymous with something small, but it wasn't always so. In past geological epochs, some of the insects living on our planet were so big that modern ones could not even dream of such sizes. Even the flying insects were intimidatingly large, not to mention the crawling ones. 
The most striking example is the huge dragonflies, Meganures. These were the largest flying insects that have ever lived on Earth. Outwardly, they were very similar to modern dragonflies, but had a wingspan of up to 70 centimeters. These giants reached their peak about 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous period, although they appeared on the planet at the beginning of the Paleozoic. For the first time, the fossil remains of Meganure were found in France in 1880. According to paleontologists, both adult Meganures and larvae were predators and ate other smaller insects. But why did giant dragonflies and huge centipedes thrive in the Carboniferous? Why did they become extinct in subsequent epochs, while other related species became much more modest in size? It's all about the increased level of oxygen in the atmosphere, as in the case of a sharp increase in the dinosaur size. Only when it comes to insects, this is the most direct consequence. The fact is, insects have a system of branching tubes, the trachea, that delivers oxygen to the organs and tissues. They are connected to holes, spiracles, on the surface of the body. In this way, insects are radically different from vertebrates that carry oxygen via blood cells. An insect cannot inhale, filling a whole bag with air, much as we do with the lungs. They just don't have lungs. The insect has to be content with the volume of air that naturally enters through the trachea, i.e. by gravity. Accordingly, the insect cannot begin to breathe faster or slower as needed. Using fluoroscopy, scientists measured the volume of the tracheal system in various species of beetles. It turned out that as the insect grows, the volume of its trachea increases 20% faster than its body weight. This feature of the respiratory system makes it impossible to increase the body size above a certain limit. Otherwise, at one point, the insect would have to turn into one continuous trachea. Calculations show that with such breathing mechanics, the biggest possible size for modern beetles is about 15 centimeters. This theoretical value coincides with the actual data. The largest modern beetles are about 15 centimeters long. They might be longer only in a few exceptional cases. And the greater the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere, the higher the threshold for the maximum body size in insects. Therefore, insects in the past, when there was more than enough oxygen in the air, could evolve to such breathtaking sizes. Everything is clear with the insects. And what, I wonder, is the size threshold for other animals? Is a real Godzilla or King Kong possible? Not everything is so simple with Godzilla, but as for King Kong, it simply cannot exist. King Kong as shown in the movie, is probably not a physically viable organism, says Jonathan Payne, a paleobiologist at Stanford University. This scientist has done extensive research into how animal body sizes have changed throughout evolution. The main causes for this limitation are gravity and biomechanics. If you take a gorilla and simply double it in size, then its body wouldn't weigh twice as much but would increase to the power of three. This is just simple math. But the width of the body, and therefore that of the bones and muscles, would only increase by the power of two. As the creature grows, it will need multiple times wider bones and more massive muscles just to keep the bones from cracking, not to mention the ability to walk. And you can forget the impressive jumps that King Kong does in the film. Can you even imagine an elephant jumping like a monkey? That's the same. Using thought experiments, scientists give very different estimates of the maximum size of a land animal. The fact is that this equation has too many variables, both external and internal. The level of oxygen in the atmosphere, gravity, way of reproduction, type of food and its availability, 
and presence of natural enemies are just a small part of these variables. This, in fact, explains why related species differ so much in size. The shrew and the capybara are both rodents, but a shrew weighs only one to three grams, while a capybara weighs 35 to 66 kilograms. There's no single reason for this. That's simply the way it is. Many agree that in each era, animals have reached the maximum that was possible based on the combination of physiological and environmental factors. As for the theoretical limit, one can only guess here. We don't know what evolution will come up with in the next billion years. Or maybe the descendants of modern animals will have carbon fiber bones, like the characters in James Cameron's avatar. Then the standards will completely change. But we are talking about land animals. In water, it's a whole different story. At least the influence of gravity is reduced by a lot. Strong bones are no longer needed, and marine animals take advantage of this fact. For example, sharks make do with mostly cartilage. In aquatic weightlessness, many other animals didn't even need such a cartilaginous light skeleton. Cephalopods generally almost lack any solid body parts. At one of the stages of evolution, they even abandoned the shell. By relying on dexterity, adaptability, and intelligence, they also excelled in both species diversity and size. They succeeded so much that sailors have been afraid of them for many centuries. And the main characters of horror legends were by no means whales, which people had long learned to hunt something else instilled terror, namely giant squids and octopuses. There are plenty of engravings picturing something huge capturing a whole ship with its tentacles, pulling it to the bottom. The scientific community didn't believe in the existence of giant squids for a long time. They were considered nothing more than mythical creatures. This was like this until 1861, when a dramatic meeting at sea turned all ideas about giant mollusks upside down. The French corvette Alecton headed to Cayenne, passed near Tenerife, the largest and most populous island of the seven Canary Islands. As the ship approached the island, the watchman on duty called out to the crew below, a large body potentially submerged, floating on the surface. Captain Frédéric Bouget himself later described the monster as a giant squid. The captain decided to catch the monster and ordered sailors to fire muskets, launch harpoons, and try to catch the squid with a noose. Finally, the sailors managed to lasso the rope around the squid's body. However, it was too heavy and the animal's body tore apart when trying to lift it on board. Only the tip of the tail remained on board, which weighed 14 kilograms, according to the captain. This story even inspired the French writer Jules Verne. In 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he described a similar encounter with a giant squid, but much less realistic. Today, we already know for sure that giant squids exist, and their size is really mind-blowing. The females can be up to 13 meters long, and the males up to 10 meters. This is based on well-documented data obtained from individuals. At the same time, there's a lot of evidence of specimens reaching and even exceeding 20 meters, but such cases haven't yet been documented. Now, the numbers alone may not impress you, but there's another example. All of you have seen a regular truck many times. It's 53 feet or 16 meters long. You can draw your own conclusions. The Santa Maria ship from the legendary expedition by Christopher Columbus was 26 meters long and 3.4 meters high. Of course, seeing something with tentacles half the size of one's flagship in the middle of the ocean would make even an experienced captain nervous. 
In addition to giant squids, their relatives, octopuses, often appeared in the legends about sea monsters. And there is more speculation here since giant octopuses, although they also exist, are more modest in size. They virtually never reveal themselves to the sailors, lending an almost exclusively unobtrusive lifestyle deep in the sea. In marine folklore, they appeared simply because of tentacles as the most striking external resemblance. In fact, giant octopuses have an average arm span of up to four meters, it's extremely rare to come across individuals with an arm span of up to six meters. This is also very impressive, but still far from the size of giant squids. Looking at all these giants, dinosaurs, whales, sharks, huge mollusks, and even well-known elephants, it may seem they live with ease and comfort because of their size. As one fairy tale character said, the life of a small creature is very dangerous. This is partially true. A mouse has many more enemies in the wild than an elephant or a whale. But giants have their own problems, and sometimes they become fatal for entire species. The supergiant ancient reptiles raise more questions. The physiology of dinosaurs, especially sauropods, is the subject of much debate in the scientific community. Unfortunately, we only have the fossilized skeleton parts at our disposal. We can figure out how the internal organs worked only using indirect signs or simply speculate. This lack of information created a whole problem the very existence of large dinosaurs and pterosaurs presents a partial scientific paradox. According to various estimates, the bones of large dinosaurs weren't strong enough to withstand the enormous weight of their bodies. The estimated muscle mass is clearly not enough for the monstrous reptiles to move properly. The circulatory system defies explanation, especially the heart capable of pumping blood through such a gigantic organism. Heated disputes in the scientific community gave rise to a lot of theories, from the most conventional to the most exotic ones. For example, it's quite plausible that sauropods didn't have a single heart, but a whole system of hearts reaching the upper sections of the neck. The dubious ability of bones and muscles to resist gravity is explained by the fact that these giants spent most of their time in water bodies. There are some desperate theories suggesting that in those days, Earth had a much weaker gravity. Say the planet's rotation speed was much higher and the centrifugal force partially compensated gravity. In any case, the huge size of sauropods at some point became almost an evolutionary limit for these animals. Their clumsiness and inability to react quickly made them vulnerable to predators. One could feed such a huge body only by consuming tons of vegetation per day. You don't even need to travel back in time. Take, for example, a giraffe. It's not unreasonably believed that a long neck is its weighty evolutionary advantage. After all, a giraffe can easily reach high branches. But the fact is that its neck turns into a terrible inconvenience when the giraffe decides to drink. Just look at the posture a poor animal has to take to quench its thirst. This is because its neck, although long, isn't particularly flexible. It has only seven vertebrae, like most other mammals. Yes, and it is also difficult for it to eat. Those who haven't seen a giraffe firsthand often mistakenly believe that it resembles a horse with a long neck. In fact, the giraffe is huge. Males can be up to six meters high, and one third is the neck. In some individuals, a short person can go under the giraffe's stomach without bending down. And this brings us back to the problem of blood supply. We could only guess how everything worked in sauropods, 
but everything is clear with giraffes, and the picture, I must say, is ambiguous. The giraffe's heart is huge and weighs about 12 kilograms. It pumps blood at a rate of 60 liters per minute, creating a pressure three times higher than in humans. The giraffe's blood is much thicker than ours. This all sounds pretty daunting in terms of potential strokes and other cardiovascular problems. But for now, the giraffes are well protected. Studies have shown that giraffe's FGFRL1 gene differs from a similar gene in other ruminants by as many as seven amino acids. And these differences contribute to a much more stable cardiovascular system and at the same time make the skeleton stronger. Perhaps sauropods had exactly the same life hack. However, the giraffe's survival in the long run largely depends on this rather thin genetic thread, and it might take a random mutation altering the FGFRL1 gene for cardiovascular and bone diseases to quickly erase giraffes from the planet's biosphere. Sadly, huge and beautiful animals in their gigantic beauty sometimes turn out to be very fragile in the face of the slightest environmental and physiological changes.